My name is Eric Castanero. I'm a resident of Palm Beach County, Florida. I hereby declare the following sworn statement under the penalty of perjury to be the truth as I know it. I make this de deposition of my own free will on Sunday, June the 23rd, the year 2012. This is a story about how J.P. Morgan Chase has used its money and influence to compromise the United States Attorney for South Dakota, Brendan Johnson, the United or South Dakota Attorney General Marty Jackley, South Dakota Supreme Court Justice Glenn Severson, South Dakota Circuit Court uh, Circuit Judge Stuart L. Tidy, the South Dakota Judicial Qualifications Commission, and the South Dakota Bar Association by hiring an attorney, Jennifer Woolman, who is a member of the South Dakota Bar Association Ethics Committee and a partner in a politically influential law firm, Woods, Fuller, Schultz, and Smith, to present evidence, testimony, and case law that Ms. Woolman knew or should have known was false and irrelevant. Each of those named individuals have been given the opportunity to deny or in any way refute what is contained in this deposition and have declined to do so. I accept that as their admission that what you are about to hear is the truth. The criminal complaints this deposition is based on are part of the record in Castanera, spelled C-A-S-T-A-N-E-I-R-A, -E versus Chase, et al., 49 Civil 11 filed in Minnehaha County, South Dakota. I financed a 2004 Acura through Chase Auto Finance on or about April 21, 2007 for a period of 48 months. In September 2010, I became delinquent on that account as a consequence of threats against my person and family by parties not affiliated with Chase. On or about the afternoon of February 15, 2011, Devin Morell and Jeremiah Donnelly arrived at my home on behalf of J.P. Morgan Chase and Recovery Phantom LLC in search of my Acura. The car was not parked on the street or in the driveway. As they arrived, I was a pat in the passenger seat of a blue automobile driven by a companion and parked in the driveway. Morell and Donnelly placed their pickup truck in a blocking position so that the vehicle I was in could not exit my drive. When I instructed Morell and Donnelly to move their vehicle, they refused. When I informed Morell and Donnelly that I considered their actions to be the same as obstructing my movement, which under South Dakota Law 22-19-17 is considered false imprisonment, Morell informed me that, quote, he had a connection, unquote, with the South Dakota Attorney General's office and was unconcerned about involving the police. I believed at that moment that Morell and Donnelly were impersonating law enforcement officers and feared for my safety. I immediately fled the 30 feet into my home to contact the police. As I was doing so, Morell and Donnelly drove away. I later learned from an interview with Morell that Morell claimed to have, quote, a brother-in-law, unquote, that was an attorney in the Attorney General's office. That would be the office of South Dakota Attorney General Marty Jackley. On February 17, 2011, I spoke with Linda Wallach, Unit Manager, Executive Office, Chase Auto Finance, as Chase, at Chase and made arrangements to negotiate a settlement for my account, as well as report the incident with Morell and Donnelly. In a February 18, 2011 telephone conversation recorded in compliance with South Dakota and federal law, Andy Solstead, Operations Manager, Vice President, Chase Auto Finance, and Wallach, representatives of Chase Auto Finance, authorized to do so, made me an offer by telephone to settle the account for my Acura in consideration of the payment of $2,500 without any additional considerations. In fact, Mr. Solstead made the following comments. You can settle the thing pay it, get your title, and you can still sue us, by the way. That doesn't mean you can't sue us. And, quote, let me make it easy for you. I wouldn't consider it unethical. I wouldn't consider it unethical if you paid us and we went and we send to you your title and you still sued us, unquote. I accepted Mr. Solstead at his word. During this discussion, Solstead declared that Chase considered the action I described by its agents, Morell and Donnelly, as inappropriate and strongly advised me to bring criminal and civil, I'm sorry, criminal and civil charges against them and Chase if I felt it was appropriate. Wallach informed me, with Solstead on the line, that Chase had, quote, charged off my account 
and were forbidden by law from changing that designation on my credit rating. The settlement offer of a payment of $2,500 without additional terms or conditions was reiterated in written correspondence from Chase employee Linda Smith, dated February 21st, 2011. This is a copy of that letter. On several occasions, Linda Wallach informed me that Solstead was the J.P. Morgan Chase manager authorized to negotiate any settlement of my account. On February 28, 2011, I had a recorded telephone conversation with Wallach in which Wallach asked me if I would draw up an agreement and send it because she was unable to mail me one, email me one. I made a prompt conditional payment of the $2,500 Chase requested in a check dated March 2, 2011, which I mailed certified and return receipt USPS number 7008281000. 00008683 to Smith the same day. These are the documents that show the letter that I sent to Ms. Smith, the postal receipt for registered mail that Ms. Smith or someone at Chase signed for, the internet web notice from the United States Postal Service indicating that the envelope had been received and signed for at Chase, the front of the check that I sent for payment, and the back of the check that I sent for payment with very specific terms and conditions, in effect a written agreement, attached to it. It also indicates that Chase cashed this check uh, on the 7th of March. The check included terms clearly outlined in the letter which accompany the payment. Quote, enclosed, you will find a copy of your February 21st letter settlement offer and a check for $2,500 as final payment in full for the reference 2004 accurate TL. This is in bold print now. This is not a partial payment, but rather a full and final payment as negotiated with authorized Chase employees. End bold print. Negotiations of said check is acceptance as full and final payment in accordance with the terms described herein and on the check. If, for any reason, Chase is no longer willing to accept this amount as full and final payment, you are hereby instructed to return the check and we can refer the matter to the court." End quote. On the check itself, the terms are very clear. Quote, Full and final payment for a 2004 Acura TL VIN number 19UUA66274A035470. Negotiation of this check is acceptance of the terms of the March 2, 2011 letter to which it references. Unquote. Under South Dakota, which is where I lived at the time, and Minnesota, which is where I purchased the vehicle law, both of those written statements are considered to be a written agreement and by Chase accepting that payment and cashing it they accepted a written agreement that would close out my account. After Chase accepted payment on March 4, 2011, Wallach wrote, quote, I have agreed to settle your present balance in the amount of $2,678.73 for the amount of $2,500, unquote. That would be this letter right here. However, she attempted to impose a new condition in the form of a release protecting Chase, Phantom, Morrill, and Donnelly from legal consequences resulting from Morrill and Donnelly's actions. That would be impersonating police officers in an effort to uh, further Chase's business, and then refused to release the lien on my title until I signed their release document. In a February 7, 2012 recorded telephone call, I learned from a Chase employee named, quote, Danielle P., unquote, that there were notes on my account dated March the 4th, 2011. That was the date that Chase received my written agreement and my payment indicating that there was an open offer to settle my account. 
Wallach then sent a March 10th letter that Chase was insisting on either the release that they had presented me after they had accepted my payment, which closed the account, or $178.73 in interest, which was the difference between the payment that they accepted and the amount that they indicated was on my account. That would be this letter here. Quote, I am enclosing another copy of the settlement agreement and release of claims agreement, which was released to you, which was mailed to you on March 4, 2011, for your signature. Please sign and return this agreement, and we will provide a signed copy for your records along with a title lien release. If you choose not to sign the enclosed agreement, we will provide a title lien release following the receipt of the final payoff the amount final payoff in the amount of $182.52." On June 27, I sent a demand letter to Smith for my title. This was after I had made payment and sent a written agreement to Chase on March the 4th, which they cashed. I considered the account closed, and under South Dakota and Minnesota law, it should have been closed. My letter specified the criminal violations I believe had been committed by Chase, Wallach, Smith, and an employee by the name of Catherine Teets, including South Dakota Codified Law 22-30A-10.1, which is involving return of stolen property considered a mitigation of punishment, that the return of such is not a defense, and 22-30A-3, theft by deception, which I felt they had been guilty of, and 22-30A-4, theft by threat, which I felt that they were doing by attempting to coerce me into, refu into providing them a release agreement after they had already accepted a written contract to settle my account. Also, 18 United States Code Section 1341, Frauds and Swindles, which has to do with sending documents through the mail, which is intended to obtain money not due you by use of threats, which I felt that Chase and, and their employees was doing. On June, on July 1st, 2000, I'm sorry, in a July 1st, 2011 letter, that would be this letter here, Chase employee Catherine Teets notified me that Chase was returning my $2,500 payment that they had previously accepted as a full and final unconditional settlement for my Acura. In that same correspondence, Chase threatened to accelerate my account, which I interpreted as Chase intending to recover or repossess my automobile that I believe they no longer had a security interest in. During this process, I was informed by Wallach and Teets that Chase recorded all of their telephone calls. All communication in this matter was conducted by telephone, email, and postal mail. On July 15, 2011, I filed a civil matter, Castanera v. Chase, et al., 49 Civil, 11002299, Pro Se, which meant I represented myself, in the South Dakota Second Judicial Circuit. That's in Minnehaha County, South Dakota. When I filed, I learned from the clerk that the case had been assigned to Judge Patricia Rappel. I was concerned about her impartiality because of several previous incidents, one of which I had to ask then presiding judge Glenn Severson, now a South Dakota Supreme Court Justice, to intercede in. Because of Chase's threat to, quote, accelerate, unquote, my account, which I interpreted as Chase's intent to recover or repossess my automobile, that I believe they no longer had a claim to, I felt I was compelled to petition for an ex parte injunction and needed the case before a judge as soon as possible. I felt that my case would stand on, on the merits and evidence and only needed a judge to be objective in order to have relief granted. Judge Rappel re <clears throat> denied my motion for injunctive relief on July 19th without providing comment or any legal justification. I served Chase, Sulstead, Wallach, Smith, Teets, Phantom, Morell, and Donnelly and received correspondence from Jennifer Woolman of Woods, Fuller, Schultz, and Smith that she was representing Chase, Sulstead, Wallach, Smith, and Teets. Phantom, Morell, and Donnelly were served on Phantom Registered Agent Richard L. Jennings at 1.53 p.m. Central, Standard, Central uh, Daylight Time on July 15, 2011, according to the United States Postal Service. 
They have yet to respond and have tried to avoid service by manipulating their corporate records filed with the South Dakota Secretary of State's office. For reasons that he has never explained, Judge Tidy has refused to make Phantom or its employees ever address their behavior or even answer the complaint that was properly served on them. On August 15th, Chase, Solstead, Wallach, Smith, Teats, and Teats filed an answer through uh, Jennifer Woolman denying that Solstead had made my recorded comments on February 18th or that, he, or that they had entered into a written contract pursuant to South Dakota Codified Law Titles 53-1 and 53-3 and that the contract uh, was accepted as a written instrument in good consideration by Chase pursuant to South Dakota Title Codified Law Title 53-6. In effect, what they said was that the written agreement that I had sent to them and the written agreement on the back of the check that they had cashed was not a written contract, despite the fact that it is very clearly under South Dakota and Minnesota law, but nothing more than just a check and an extension of a check. Why they could ever feel they could get away with that, I don't know. But apparently, with Judge Tidy's assistance, they felt they could. On August 24th, 2000, or 2011, to Chase v. Castanera et al. was transferred from Rappel, who had refused to issue an injunction despite the overwhelming evidence in front of her, to a Judge Sertska, and the next day to Judge Stuart Tidy. Both orders were signed by court employee Lacey Benson. The orders generating those transfers, nor their origins or circumstances, have ever been provided to me. Let me say that again. This case was transferred from one judge to another judge. That would be the judge that I would have to file all documents, uh, injunctions, requests for relief, everything with, and yet the Second Judicial Circuit felt it was never important to actually notify me which judge had the case. On January 9, 2012, I made a recorded call to, quote, Mary, unquote, in the Second Judicial Circuit Court, <clears throat> court Clerk's office. She explained that it was her understanding that orders reassigning a case weren't sent to pro se litigants like me, only to lawyers. In other words, that the fact that I had not hired an attorney, but was representing myself, was somehow being used to deny me access to the courts. Since I was representing myself, I was entitled to the same access to information as an attorney, and denying me such information is a violation of my constitutional right of equal access to the courts. This type of behavior by court employees is done to force individuals to hire an attorney instead of representing themselves and wouldn't exist unless the judges, who know better, allow it. Unaware that my case was no longer assigned to repel, I responded on September 26, 2011 to the Chase defendant's answer with a motion for summary judgment, a supporting brief, and exhibits as well as a motion for default judgment against Phantom, Morrell and Donnelly. I call them the phantom defendants. A party files a motion for summary judgment when the other side has not presented any relevant fa material facts that dispute your claim. I felt that was the case here. Chase didn't deny what I said. In fact, they, their answer was, in fact, a, a, an admission of guilt. Chase's answer was more of a confession than a, a defense. I sent the court's copy of those pleadings and a certificate of service to, to repel, enclosed with a cover letter containing the following language, quote, enclosed you will find additional pleadings in the matter at hand. I ask you to hold them in abeyance until a new judge has been assigned to the case, and copied presiding Judge Caldwell, Judge Rappel's direct superior. Felt the past history between Judge Rappel and me established a good cause to question Rappel's objectivity and did not submit the pleadings to the court clerk because I did not want Judge Rappel to rule on them. She had stated her bias against me previously, and I felt she had demonstrated it in this case. In effect, what I was doing was sending the, the documents to the judge that I, was, that I had been informed was assigned to the case, and of course no one had ever sent me any documentation indicating that anybody else had been assigned to the case, and ask her to remove herself from the case, and when she did, to transfer those documents to the judge that had been assigned to the case so that that judge could rule on them. When Rappel received the pleadings, she did not inform me that she was no longer involved in the case. 
She did not submit the pleadings to the clerk of, clerk of courts for filing, which would have been the appropriate thing to do. She did not submit the pleadings to Judge Caldwell, despite my request that she do so. Quote, Please consider this letter an informal request for you to withdraw from the above matter and submit the file to presiding Judge Caldwell for further deposition. Unquote. She could have returned the documents to me with an explanation. Her choice, according to Judge Tidy, uh, that uh, he informed me of later, was to forward them on to, to Tidy in September without an explanation to him as to why they were sent to her in the first place. This was the story that Tidy gave me in a January 19th letter, although he never explained why he did not take five minutes to send me a letter seeking clarification of my intentions or desires as almost anybody else would have done. I did not request a hearing when I filed my summary judgment motion, motion because I believed my pleadings and the Chase defendant's answer provided sufficient cause for the court to rule in my favor on the merits. I also petitioned the court to impose sanctions against the defendants, Woolman and Woods, for filing a frivolous, a frivolous defense that I documented was full of misrepresentations. In other words, they had lied to the court. I argued that it was reasonable to believe that the Chase defendants and their counsel would prefer the matter not to reach a courtroom where sworn testimony would be required because such a formal review would aggravate the case for sanctions against the Chase defendants, Woolman, and Woods, and or place the defendants at risk of perjury. Despite overwhelming evidence that at least one of the defendants have lied in their sworn testimony, Judge Tidy has refused to require that any of them address the discrepancies in their testimony. So, in effect, Judge Tidy has made sure that despite the fact that he was provided overwhelming evidence that Chase and their employees lied to him through their, through their attorney, Jennifer Woolman, a friend and a, a partner in, a, in Judge Tidy's former law firm, Judge Tidy has never required any of them to testify under oath before him as to what the discrepancies were and why they existed. I spent October, November, and December of 2011 patiently waiting for Rappel to transfer my case to another judge so I could proceed, in complete ignorance of the fact that she had already uh, done so. Tidy had been assigned the case on or about August 26, 2011, and admits to coming into possession of my summary pleadings sometime between September 20, 27, 2011 and October 1, 2011. Tidy failed to rule on my summary pleadings, and he has never explained why, despite the fact that he is ethnically obligated to do so. He did not inform me of any procedural defect that would have prevented him from making a ruling, despite the fact that I was a pro se litigant and I'm entitled to the benefits of my pleadings being held to, quote, a less stringent standards than formal pleadings drafted by lawyers, unquote. That is from Haynes v. Kerner, 4000 U.S. 519, 1972. That's a U.S. Supreme Court decision that says that pro se plaintiffs or, defend or, or litigants like myself must be held to a lesser standard, or in other words, the judges are, respired, are re required to interpret what it is that that litigant wants to do, and if necessary, ask for guidance from that litigant as to what their intents are. Judge Tidy ignored that, despite the fact that it is a basic constitutional right that I have. Woolman admits to having received her copies of my summary pleadings at the same time as Rappel in September, and I was, and was aware that I had not requested a hearing. Her responsibility to her clients would have, been, would have obligated her to present the court some form of pleadings in opposition to my summary motion or seek a settlement before the court made its ruling. Yet somehow, Woolman knew that Tidy had no intention of ruling at that time. This is because Tidy participated in ex parte communication, that's contact with one of the parties in a case without involving or informing the other party or parties with at least one member of his former law firm, Woods Fuller, to inform them that the attorney that they had assigned to the case did not need to file a defense for the summary uh, judgment motion he had decided to ignore. Judge Tidy's actions violated multiple sections of the South Dakota Canons of Judicial Ethics. Canon number two of, that, of those judicial ethics was very clear. A judge shall, shall avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety 
in all of the judge's activities. Subsection A. A judge shall, res shall respect and comply with the law and shall act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the integrity and impartiality of the judiciary. Subsection B. A judge shall not allow family, social, political, or other relationships to influence the judge's uh, ju judicial conduct or judgment. Section D. Disciplinary Responsibilities. 2. A judge who receives information indicating a substantial likelihood that a lawyer has committed a violation of the Code of Professional Responsibility. That would be his friend and the partner in his former law firm, Jennifer Wool uh, Woolman, should take, appropriate, uh, should take appropriate action. A judge having knowledge that a lawyer has committed a violation of the Code of Professional Responsibility that raises a substantial question as to that lawyer's honesty trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer in other respects shall inform the appropriate authority. Section E, Disqualification. Section 1. A judge shall disqualify himself or herself in a proceeding in which the judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Canon number 3. A judge shall perform the duties of judicial office, office impartiality and diligently. Subsection B, adjudicative responsibilities. Section 1, a judge shall hear and decide matters assigned to the judge except those in which disqualification is required. Of course, he did not do that. Two, subsection 2, a judge shall be faithful to the law and maintain professional competence in it. A judge shall not be swayed by partisan interests, public clamor, or fear of criticism. And Section 7, a judge shall accord to every person who has a legal interest in a proceeding, that would be me, or that person's lawyer, the right to be heard according to law. A judge shall not initiate, permit, or consider ex parte communications, again, that's having a discussion with someone from his former law firm to provide information to the attorney from that law firm that she did not have to defend against a motion that he was legally obligated to rule on, outside the presence of the parties concerning a pending or impending, impending proceeding. And again, I was never notified that he had informed Ms. Woolman uh, through intermediaries of his decision to not rule on something he was ethically obligated to do. On January 5th, 2012, Woolman filed a motion for summary judgment, just like the one I had, supporting affidavits with supporting affidavits from Solstead, Wallach, Smith, and Teats, and a motion for a hearing on January 23rd on behalf of the Chase defendants, which I received on January 6th. Woolman did not contact me before scheduling the hearing to agree on a date, nor did anyone from the clerk's office, despite their policy that all attorneys are given that courtesy. All attorneys are given the courtesy of being able to decide whether or not a hearing is convenient for them, and if not, then the matter has to go before the judge. That was not done in my case. On January 25th, I made a recorded call to the Second Judicial Circuit Court Clerk's Office and was transferred to a lady named, quote, Chris, unquote. She explained their policy was to allow attorneys to schedule hearings without the consent of a pro se litigant, that would be me, but would not grant the same privilege to a pro se litigant. In other words, the attorney would have the right to schedule hearings almost at will, but as a pro se litigant, I wouldn't, even though I'm supposed to have the exact same rights as the attorney. Again, since I was representing myself, I was entitled to the same access to uh, information as an attorney, and denying me such information is a violation of my constitutional rights of equal access to the courts. This type of behavior by court employees is done to force individuals to hire an attorney instead of representing themselves and wouldn't exist, exist unless the judges, who know better, allow it. The next day I received a letter from Tidy indicating that he had been assigned the case. He had ordered a hearing for the 23rd and that he was disclosing that he had been a partner in Woolman's firm, Woods Fuller. He indicated that, despite having recent dealings with the firm, he believed he could be impartial. TD did not acknowledge my summary motion. 
I was shocked. I had patiently waited for Rappel to transfer the case to another judge so my summary motion to win the case could be heard, and I was now faced with the defendant's summary motion in 17 days with no explanation as to why my summary motion had not been ruled on. On January 9, 2012, I made a recorded telephone call to the Second Judicial Clerk's, Circuit Court Clerk's Office and spoke with, quote, Misty, unquote. She informed me of the August 24th and 25th orders 20, tran <clears throat> transferring the case from Rappel to Sertska to Tidy. Quote, Misty, unquote, also informed me that the case did not include a copy of my summary pleadings or any records of them. In fact, the record was wiped clean of the motion I had filed to end the case back in September. I then followed that call with another and spoke to Mary in the same office. She explained that documents are given to a judge and cannot be placed in a file unless the judge returns them. My documents, of course, have been given to Judge Rappel. She also explained that occasionally judges have documents in their office that the clerks have no control over. At that point, I requested assistance from Court Administrator Carl Theonis in determining from which office or hands my pleadings disappeared. The call was recorded. Theonis did not reply for four days and then made it very clear he had no stomach for getting involved in any matter where two judges might have been involved in misconduct, or worse. Theonis then told me that he wouldn't discuss the matter with me because, quote, you record your calls, unquote. While I was waiting on a response from Theonis, the calendar was moving towards the January 23rd hearing that Woolman is scheduled without my consent. I find it interesting that an employee of the court, the clerk responsible for, for handling all of the records of that court, felt that he had so much to hide that he couldn't discuss what had happened to my documents in a recorded telephone call. On January 13, 2012, I wrote Tidy detailing my concerns for my missing pleadings and a summary of my efforts to locate them. I also sought a postponement of the hearing on the 23rd that I had not consented to in order to allow the court to investigate the highly irregular activities that had transpired involving the pleadings I had submitted over the three months earlier. I sent copies of that letter to Severson, that would be Justice Supreme Court Justice Severson and Presiding Judge Caldwell. On January 18, 2012, not having heard from the court and aware of the hearing on the 23rd, that would be January the 23rd, I served subpoenas duces tecum, that means that the witness must bring specific documents, for J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, Andy Solstead, Linda Wallach, and Linda Smith on Woolman. I requested this discovery because when I reviewed Woolman, or I'm sorry, Solstead, Wallach, Smith, and Teats affidavits, I found testimony that I knew was false, incomplete, and misleading, which is a violation of South Dakota Codified Law 19-12-3, Rule 403. That the documents had significant and relevant factual omissions, in other words, they simply kept out important information, and I had substantial evidence to prove it. Woolman was also lawyer spinning the single sticking point in the oral argument between me, Solstead, Wallach, on February 18, 2011 the status of the, quote, charge-off, unquote, on my credit history. As her reason, the parties did not convert their oral agreement into a written one. In other words, they claimed that they made an oral agreement, but they never developed it into a written one. South Dakota and Minnesota law doesn't require one party or the other to initiate a written agreement, only that if a written agreement is developed and the other party agrees to it, which in this case Chase did on March the 4th, 2011, that alone stands as a written agreement and changing the oral agreement into a written agreement then makes it binding. Yet Chase had accepted my payment with my written terms on March the 4th, 2011. And as I uh, previously showed you, the letter from Linda Wallach dated that date, which clearly indicates that they had received and accepted my terms and payment. The facts here were simple. Once I accepted that Chase would not adjust the notate notation on my credit report, I accepted Chase's terms and completed my end of the bargain by submitting the written agreement that Wallach had requested, and Chase had accepted the terms of that agreement and the attach pa attached payment on March the 4th, 2011. Yet, Woolman, 
presented Chase's new March 4, 2011 proposed settlement agreement as a relevant issue, even though at that point they had settled the account and it was no longer considered to be relevant or, and, and or moot. And her argument that the format of the settlement agreement between me and Chase was somehow relevant even though the issue was now closed. Chase's March 4th proposal was moot once Chase accepted my March 2nd written agreement and the format of an enforceable agreement was not relevant in South Dakota or Minnesota law as long as, as it is written and carries the prescribed elements. In other words, it has all the things that are required to make an agreement a written agreement. The fact that Woolman simply ignored Wallach's statement on February 18th that Chase could not remove the quote charge off unquote from my credit report even though Chase's recording of the telephone conversation would have given her access to it, is a clear indication that Woolman willfully misrepresented the facts. I was also aware that Solstead, Wallach, Smith, and Teats knew or should have known of these defects because Wallach and Teats had admitted that Chase recorded his calls. In other words, Chase had its own recording of the telephone calls and Woolman, as their attorney, would have had access to all of that information, whether she asked me for copies of my recordings or not. Woolman was legally and ethically responsible for the validity of any evidence or representations that she made to the court. The virtually identical language in the three different affidavits, filed by Solstead in Arizona and Wallach and Smith in New York, from clients separated by each other by over 2,000 miles, implies that Woolman, the lawyer, composed the affidavits and simply told her clients to sign them. Yet she ignored Chase's recordings which were available for her to review when she did so. In effect, she made up affidavits that would support her request for summary judgment, ignoring the facts, ignoring what her own clients had said, ignoring the recordings of what her own clients had said, ignoring the written agreement that her clients had accepted, and told the court that none of that existed. That's a lie. Not only is it unethical under any bar association's rules, it's illegal. The same day, I filed a motion and brief with the court to exclude Salstead, Wallach, Smith, and Teats's affidavits based on these significant flaws and to compel Salstead, Wallach, Smith, and Teats to be brought before the court in order to be directly examined. In effect, what I said was they lied and the best way to make sure that they were telling the truth was to bring them before the judge have them testify under oath, and be cross-examined. This is a standard legal practice that Woolman herself has employed on many occasions and one that Tidy has approved in other cases. I allege that the actual intent of the Chase defendant's affidavits may have been to avoid having to testify in person concerning the discrepancies of their earlier recorded statements and their pleadings. Woolman then filed a motion to quash the subpoenas. In effect, Woolman the lawyer, had used this exact same tactic that I was, which was asking that the, the court order the defendants to testify in person before them under cross-examination to determine whether or not they were telling the truth. In other cases, when it would benefit her and her clients. In this case, because she knew she didn't want her clients to be forced to testify under oath in person and face cross-examination and face the recordings of their own, of their own words, she filed a motion to quash those subpoenas so that her clients would not have to appear in court. Tidy finally responded to me on January 19th, and I received his letter on Friday the 20th. That's the last day before, the last business day before the hearing was scheduled. Judge Tidy explained in his January 19th, 2012 letter that he thought the copies of my pleadings he received from Judge Rappel were, quote, courtesy copies, unquote, because they were provided to him without adequate explanation and he could not understand why I didn't move forward on my motion. Despite Judge Tidy acknowledging that he had quote courtesy top copies unquote of my summary pleadings, he never ruled on them. Along with providing this explanation of his actions, Tidy indicated he was inclined to grant me a continuance if Woolman did not object. What Judge Tidy was saying was that Judge Rappel had sent him copies of my pleadings but did not explain why she had them and why she was sending them to him. He didn't check with the clerk, clerk's office to find out whether or not those copies of those pleadings had been filed, or if he did and found out that they hadn't, 
He never sent me any sent me any correspondence asking why I would have sent him copies without sending them to the clerk. He also didn't ask a, in correspondence from Judge Rappel as to why she had sent him those documents in the first place. In effect, what he did was deny me the opportunity to file the motion that I had to end the case in my favor in a timely manner. None of that is ethical. None of it's appropriate. And it stinks because the lawyer he was protecting was a partner in his former law firm. Of course, there's also evidence that I have not yet presented to the court, and I'm waiting for Judge Tidy and, and Ms. Woolman to testify under oath that they've done nothing wrong, that indicates that there was, in effect, ex parte or inappropriate conversation between Judge Tidy and an intermediary with Woods, Fuller, Schultz, and Smith, Ms. Woolman's law firm, indicating that Ms. Woolman did not have to respond to the documents that I filed in September and that Judge Tidy would cover for her. I look forward to the opportunity to present that to a court after Judge Tidy and Ms. Woolman have testified as to the fact that they say they never did this. I did not receive a telephone call from Ms. Woolman nor any form of written correspondence from her concerning an objection that Friday, that Friday, or the, the next day, Saturday. Woolman did not place any form of communication concerning an objection with the United States Postal Service on Friday, which should have been delivered on Saturday. The only communication Woolman sent was an email sometime late that Friday that I had difficulty opening. However, I did receive Woolman's motion to, qu to quash the subpoenas she placed in the mail that Friday, the next day on Saturday. Because I did not hear from Woolman, I had no reason to believe that there was a hearing the following Monday. What Ms. Woolman did was send me regular postal mail, first class, a copy of the motion she filed to make sure that her clients did not have to testify in person in a hearing on Monday. What she didn't send me by postal mail was notification that she intended to object to the hearing. Now, Ms. Woolman knew that that was a critical issue because the judge had made it a critical issue. She had the opportunity to send me overnight mail. She had the opportunity to have a messenger bring the document to my home less than six miles from her office. She had the opportunity to have a process server delivered on me. She chose none of those options. What she says she did is send me an email that I had a difficult time opening and could not open until two days after the hearing. At that point, I would not have been able to medically participate in a hearing regardless. Beginning with my call to court personnel on January 9th, I began to believe that I was being systemically denied access to the courts. Expedited into a court hearing with a judge that could not reasonably explain why he had not ruled on my summary judgment motion against an attorney that had never been required to explain uh, as to how she somehow knew that Judge Tidy would not rule on my summary motion in front of a judge that had been a partner in Woolman's law firm and that judge that had, had recently re retained on a that the, that, that the judge, Judge Tidy, had recently retained on a personal matter. In effect, Judge Tidy had been very clear that he had recently used his former law firm, Woods, Fuller, Schultz, and Smith, Woolman, uh, the firm that Woolman was a partner in, he was a customer of them, yet he felt that he could be completely impartial. My deep concern that I was being denied impartial justice caused me so much stress, I had several blood pressure related blackouts. I am currently under medical care for severe hypertension and stress. Because I did not receive any objection from Woolman, I left on Monday morning, January 23rd, for a previously planned personal issue. Because Woolman raised an objection about a continuance for the hearing on Monday the 23rd via email with Tidy. In other words, she sent Tidy an email indicating that she raised the objection, but she couldn't. She felt that it was unnecessary to use any form of expedited method to inform me of the same. He decided to hold the hearing. However, even though he had said that he was inclined not to. However, court personnel were unable to reach me to notify me that Tidy had changed his mind. Tidy then instructed Woolman to schedule a hearing for that Friday, the 27th, and prepare an order. Woolman con constructed the order so that her only motions were only her motions were listed as an agenda for the hearing and Tidy signed it. Here's what happened. 
Judge Tidy apparently decided that when I did not show up for a hearing that I had been told wasn't going to take place, or had reason to believe wasn't going to take place on the 23rd, he got angry. And then filed, and then instructed Woolman to schedule another hearing within 10 days. She scheduled it for four days later. She then constructed an order so that only her motions, only the things she wanted to bring before the judge, were listed as the agenda for the hearing. That would not have been consistent uh, with equal access to the courts. Judge Tidy, who knew better, or should have known better, signed it anyways. That was completely inappropriate on his part. On January 25th, I made a recorded call to the clerk's office in order to schedule a hearing for a later date that would include my summary and other motions, included it, including the issue of requiring the Chase defendants to appear for an examination. In other words, I wanted them to come into the court, swear under oath that what they had said in their affidavits, that I knew was not true, was true, and be subjected to cross-examination. In other words, I was going to ask them questions about the telephone recordings that I had and why that contradicted what they said in their affidavits. I intended to present the, this new hearing date to Judge Tidy as an alternative to the hearing he had scheduled on the 27th. In effect, what I was doing was asking the judge to reconsider the inappropriate order that he signed with one that would have allowed both parties to present, there was me and the other party, to present both of our cases so that there would be a fair hearing. Court employee, quote, Abby, unquote, conferenced in Ms. Woolman. In other words, she, this the court employee would not make an, uh, schedule a hearing without bringing in the attorney, Jennifer Woolman. I had not been granted this opportunity uh, when Ms. Woolman had scheduled the original hearing for the 23rd, but now it was very important to make sure that Ms. Woolman's rights somehow or the other were not affected but then refused to schedule any other hearing besides the, one on the, besides the one that had already been scheduled on the 27th without Judge Tidy's permission. In other words, at that point, I was not being denied the opportunity to schedule any more hearings. Woolman then became very condescending and abusive, and the cumulative effect was more than I could handle in my medical condition and blacked out. At that point, I was under a great deal of stress. I felt that I was now fighting a judge and a lawyer and one of the largest financial institutions in the world. And when I came to the understanding that the judge and the, the court personnel were going to do everything they can to make sure, or everything they could to make sure that I was hustled into court so they could come up with a bogus ruling, not based on the facts, not based on the evidence, and based on perjured testimony, the stress level just became too much. During this conversation, at the seven and one half minute mark of the call, I absolutely lost, lost coherency. The recording shows that Abby was asking me questions and I replied several times that I was having a hard time breathing. I then began to babble. This lasted for over five minutes. Abby seemed more concerned about getting a phone number from me to contact me than the fact that I was clearly in medical trouble. Miss Woolman then solved Abby's problem by providing her the phone number she requested. They then hung up. At no point during the five minutes was I, that I was clearly in medical distress did either of them ask me whether I was all right. Now, the only reason I know all this is because I had been recording the telephone call. And uh, I, <laughs> I can only say that it was a horrible, horrible experience. I was so stressed out, my blood pressure was so bad that I was babbling on the telephone. Um, why any human being would not have shown some concern, some compassion for my health at that point is beyond me. But what we're talking about here is a court employee and a lawyer for J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Neither of them showed any concern. The appropriate thing to do would have been to call 911 and have them send an ambulance to my home, or at the very least call me back to make sure that I was okay. Neither of them did that. They have never explained why. I'm not sure that any explanation could ever cover such behavior. When my girlfriend, a registered nurse, came home that afternoon, she was so concerned about my condition, she immediately took my blood pressure. The first reading was 168 over 116. For anybody that knows blood pressures, that's get thee to a doctor quickly range. And the next was about the same. She rushed me, rushed me to the closest, closest urgent care facility 
where I was examined. The six blood pressure readings they took there were consistent with the reading that caused the initial concern. I was prescribed a blood pressure medication and was referred to the Avera Heart Hospital for a battery of tests scheduled for the next afternoon. Somehow during the next two hours I sent Tidy an email with my previously prepared proposed order attached, although I don't remember doing it. After all that, he denied it anyways. I informed Tidy of these circumstances in a letter dated January 26, with copies to Justice Severson and Presiding Judge Caldwell. However, Tidy was extremely reluctant to grant another continuance. Remember, this is an issue over $178. A series of emails ensued between me, Tidy, and Woolman, and Tidy finally agreed to the postponement until February 21st, 2012, when I presented a medical order requesting I be allowed to avoid the hearing for the next day. In other words, Judge Tidy was more concerned about getting a hearing in a case over $178 in change that was not going to break Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase uh, Bank. He was more concerned about getting a hearing in the next day than he was about my medical condition. This is a case that he had been sitting on for four months and refused to, to, to rule on. On February 2nd, 2012, I wrote Tidy suggesting a proposed schedule for the hearing for a hearing separate from the one scheduled for February 21st, specifically to take testimony from Solstead, Wallach, Smith, and Teats, in order to allow the court to proceed on a factual basis instead of the flawed testimony of their answer, motion for summary judgment, and the individual affidavits. In effect, what I was asking the judge to do was separate their testimony, the testimony of the Chase. J.P. Morgan Chase employees separate their testimony because they would have to travel a long distance to come for it from any rulings he was going to make on the case. I felt that any honest ethical judge would be more concerned about making sure that they had a ruling or they made a ruling based on factual evidence and uh, documents that were relevant to the case than the representation of an attorney. Remember, the attorney is being paid hundreds and hundreds of dollars an hour by J.P. Morgan Chase to say good things about J.P. Morgan Chase. It's absurd to make a ruling based on that, particularly when the facts and the evidence say something completely different. I did not want to, to address the enforcement of the subpoenas on the same day as Solstead, Wallach, Smith, and Teats would be required to testify in support of their summary motion. Should TD require rule to enforce the subpoenas because each of them would have had to travel about 1,500 miles and it would give Woolman an excuse not to produce them, even if she had been ordered to do so. In effect, what I was hoping to do was avoid having Judge Tidy rule on the day that he intended on ruling on other, on other motions, including Chase's summary judgment motion, rule that, those, that the Chase employees, the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank employees, would have to testify. And then Ms. Woolman could have said, well, they can not testify because they're 2,000 miles away and can't get here in the next hour to do so. This would have seemed like a no-brainer to me, but apparently Judge Tidy didn't think that was, uh, that was appropriate or relevant. Tidy was well aware of these facts but denied this request and insisted the subpoenas be addressed at the same hearing as the Chase defendant's summary motion. This was a clear sign he never had any intention of allowing Woolman's clients to damage her case. In effect, he was saying, since he never had any intention of requiring them to testify as to why their affidavits conflicted with the facts and evidence before him, that he was going to rule on the subpoenas the same day he was going to rule on the summary motion, and that, of course, meant he had already made his mind up, despite the fact that the evidence was, uh, did not support the decision he intended to make. On Sunday, February 4, 2012, I received via the United States Postal Service a first-class envelope from J.P. Morgan Chase Bank containing a Form 1099-C, Cancellation of Debt, pertaining to my account number 107-11018210500 with Chase for my 2004 Acura TL. It turned out to be the smoking gun in my civil case. That would be this document right here.
Because the 1099 appeared to contradict the sworn testimony and pleadings submitted to the court by the defendants, I called the number to pro provided on the document on Tuesday morning, February 7, 2012, to obtain clarification. This is required under federal law. Under federal law, a telephone number must be provided on a 1099-C so that the recipient, that would be me, could get clarification as to information contained on the 1099. The company sending it, in this case J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, is required under federal law to provide full disclosure and information about the 1099. In a recorded telephone call that lasted approximately 17 and one half minutes, I was informed of the purpose, origin, and account specific details of the 1099 by an employee named Danielle P. I did not initially provide her with my name or account information because I wanted some general information and I was concerned that I would not receive any information once they learned who I was. Remember, J.P. Morgan Chase was aware that I was suing them at the time. Danielle P. informed me that she worked at J.P. Morgan Chase National Recovery Center in Phoenix, Arizona. A 1099 is generated when an account is charged off, and that my account had been charged off on January 31st, 2011. All that information would have been consistent with what Wallach had told me on the, on the 18th of February. 2011. This date is critical. Danielle P. informed me that Solstead, that was the man that I had spoken to on the, in a recorded conversation on the 18th of February 2011, and that had told me it was just perfectly acceptable for me to give Chase their money and I could sue them later. They wouldn't have any problem with that. That Solstead was the head of the J.P. Morgan Chase National Recovery Center Department covering auto loans. Her statement corroborated an earlier statement made by Wallet. At that point I provided my personal information so I could learn more about my specific account. Danielle P. informed me that there were notes on my account dated March 4, 2011 indicating that there was an open offer to settle my account. That's the same day that Chase received my written agreement and my check, cashed the check, which bound them to the written agreement that I had included with it. Um, I I asked her to transfer me to such a person. After several minutes of waiting, she informed me that she had been given instructions by Solstead, that she was not to authorized to transfer me to a supervisor, and that Solstead would contact me later that day to question uh, to answer questions about that about my account as required by federal law. Over four months later, I have yet to receive a return phone call from anyone at J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. On February 9, 2012, I contacted the IRS for a clarification of the 1099-C cancellation of debt form. I was directed to the key at the bottom of the 1099 form for an explanation of what each box meant and the IRS website for a copy of the instructions for the 1099-C. The instructions for a 1099-C published by the United States Internal Revenue Service have four pages. On page three, there is a defined section titled, When a Debt is Cancelled. It lists nine different conditions under which a creditor is reporting to the IRS that it has cancelled a debt and is reporting uh, the discharged amount as income for the taxpayer. And that would be these instructions right here. And this is page three. Right there. Number six on the form states, quote, a discharge of indebtedness under an agreement between the creditor and the debtor to cancel the debt at less than full consideration, end quote, which is exactly what I had with Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. We had come to an agreement to settle my account for a small amount less than the actual debt. Uh, I would imagine in part that was because they were concerned that I might at some point publicize or litigate against them for the tactics they were using uh, by having their employees or their agents attempt to act on their behalf by claiming to be law enforcement officers. Regardless of the reason, uh, number six is exactly what happened between the parties. 
This is exactly what I had claimed had happened, but the Chase defendants, through their attorney Woolman, had denied to the, in the, to the court in their motion for summary judgment that, quote, an agreement between the creditor and the debtor to cancel the debt, unquote, had ever existed between the parties. This is very difficult for them to say because on the 4th of March, they accepted the written agreement that I had sent to them and cashed the check, which was the same thing as signing the agreement. On February 21st, I again called the IRS for an additional clarification of the 1099-C form. I was told that box one, date canceled, was the date that Chase had canceled or charged off my debt for the Acura loan. According to the IRS, the date listed in box one is the date Chase closed my account and that partial amount amounts of running balances that cannot be canceled or charged off. In effect, once the account is charged off, it is closed and the recovery or repossession process begins. At that point, Chase management personnel like Salstead then consider accepting a negotiated offer to settle the account, just like what happened here. What Chase did was decide that they no longer would carry it as an open loan. They charged it off. At that particular point, they could either repossess the automobile or accept uh, some form of payment from me to settle the account. They did the latter. They accepted a payment, they accepted it along with a written agreement. At that particular point, once they charged the account off, it no longer was an installment loan. It was, in their minds, a bad debt. Woolman, the attorney for J.P. Morgan Chase, argued that under Minnesota law, that debts cannot be modified uh, through an oral agreement, or they cannot be modified through a written agreement. In this case, there was no more debt to be modified. Uh, the contract between us had been voided, or not voided, but it had been defaulted on by me, and at that point Chase simply wanted to have all of their money paid to them, which is what I did. So by Woolman suggesting that the that there was still an open account is wrong, and something that she knew was wrong, because Chase had charged off the account, had never uh, disputed they had charged off the account, and in fact Woolman had indicated uh, that Chase had charged off the account, and it was her excuse for why there was never an oral agreement, or not why there was never a written agreement after the oral agreement between the parties. This is a clear misrepresentation to the court, and it's a perfect example of lawyer spin. When lawyers lie to the court, the judge is supposed to impose sanctions on them for wasting the judge's time and hurting the integrity of the judiciary. In this case, Judge Tidy, a former partner of Woolman's old law firm and a recent customer of that law firm and Woolman's friend was doing everything he could to protect her from herself and protect her client, a very important client uh, to a firm like Woods Fuller, Schultz and Smith in a state, South Dakota, where banks like J.P. Morgan Chase own everything. They own the legislature, they own the governor's office, they own the courts. When you have that much money and so many jobs are dependent on you and other banks, organizations like J.P. Morgan Chase own everything. On February 21st, I again called the IRS for an additional clarification of the 1099-C form. I'm sorry, I read that already. The date listed on the form was 2-22-2011, four days after Sulstead, Wallach, and I came to the agreement to settle my account. The Chase defendants, through Woolman, had denied in their motion for summary judgment that they had ever canceled or charged off my debt and the installment agreement between the parties was still in effect. This is the central part of their legal agreement, or their legal argument. Again, what they're saying here is that the account was never settled, yet Chase filed a report with the IRS as part of a standard legal filing that they in, they in fact had settled the account with me and Chase would not have any reason to file a 1099-C unless they had settled the account with me. So they were telling the IRS that they had settled the account and that they were writing off money from their profit, from their books, but they were telling the court in South Dakota that none of that had happened. So in effect what Chase was doing was washing or laundering money off of its books by saying one thing to the IRS and then telling a court in South Dakota that that had never happened. Clearly, they were lying to someone. Chase's de declaration to the IRS on, uh, on the 1099-C cancellation of debt form also contradicts Sol Solstead, Smith, 
and Wallach's affidavits, in which they testified that I had refused their offer to settle. Solstead, Smith, and Wallach gave the sworn testimony despite their employer, Chase, Chase also being their co-defendant, having made the declaration to the IRS that Chase had canceled or charged off an amount of $2,504.40. That's box two of the form itself. And that, again, would be this 1099 form. And they made that statement four days, four days after I contend that, that Solstead, Wallach, and I came to the agreement to settle my account. So on the 18th of February, the three of us, in a, tel in a recorded telephone conversation, came to an agreement to settle the account. On the 21st of February, I received a letter from Linda Smith in Le Linda Wallach's office, again uh, reiterating the settlement agreement. However, they claimed that I had refused it. I did not. The next day, according to Chase, Chase reported that the account was settled. And within a few days after that, Chase was in possession of my written agreement and my check. Yet they continued to tell a court in South Dakota that they had not done any of this. And the judge, Stuart Tidy, despite receiving every one of the documents that I've either described or shown in this deposition, has refused to hold them accountable for clearly lying to somebody. Please pay attention to the following numbers, and I apologize for the math. Solstead's affidavit declared that the amount I owed Chase was $2,661.32. That's what Mr. Solstead swore under oath to the court that I owed. And the amount I agreed to, to and did pay Chase was $2,500. So the difference should have been $161.32, and that's what the 1099-C should have been for, $161.32, because that was the amount that Chase wrote down from, their, uh, from the loan and essentially cleaned off of their books. And as a taxpayer, I'm responsible for paying taxes on that $161.32. What Chase did was they claimed that they wrote off $2,504.40. So clearly, not only are they defrauding the IRS about uh, saying that they had not closed or that they had closed off a loan that they were telling the courts in South Dakota that they had not, but they even lied about the amount. And you have to wonder how much money uh, organizations and financial institutions like J.P. Morgan Chase are writing off of their books and, in effect. Uh, in defrauding the IRS out of for tax money because that $2,400 difference they're never going to pay taxes on. IRS Tax Code 26 CFR Section 1 P-1 A subsection 1 is very clear about when a 1099-C must be filed with the IRS. Quote, a discharge of indebtedness is deemed to have incurred, occurred except as provided in paragraph B3 of this section if and only if there has occurred an identifiable event described in paragraph B2 of this section. It further states that the identifiable event in question is Section F, a discharge of indebtedness pursuant to the agreement between an applicable entry and a debtor to discharge indebtedness at less than full consideration. That is, of course, exactly what happened in my case. Chase agreed to accept an amount $161 less than what they claimed I owed them, and that was the reason that they filed a 1099-C with the IRS. Again, according to Chase and, the, and according to what they, their attorney, Jennifer Woman, has filed with the South Dakota court. And it, what Judge Stuart L. Tidy has refused to investigate is that if they did not settle the account with me, as they have claimed in the South Dakota court, there would have been no reason whatsoever to file a 1099 because no, quote, 
identifiable event, unquote, would have occurred under the tax codes. So Chase, a company that, a bank that has a tremendous number of employees dedicated specifically to complying with IRS regulations, had decided, based on their records, not provided to the attorney and not manipulated by their employees, that I had in fact paid off my account and they were responsible for, no, for informing the IRS that I now had an amount that I was responsible for paying taxes on. This 1099-C is critical because it shows that a well-staffed and funded department and personnel at the co-defendant Chase, remember Chase is their co-defendant, that are responsible for complying with tax laws, perhaps unaware that the document was critical to a legal dispute, did believe that an identifiable event related to my account occurred in 2011, which required that Chase made a 1099-C filing with the IRS. Again, this would be consistent with Wallach's March 10th letter, and uh, that Chase had written off or discharged $182.52. That figure is different because Chase added some interest onto the $161 that they originally claimed they were writing off. I knew the 1099 was important and I had asked for it as part of my January subpoena that Tidy had denied. I knew that there was something wrong with the accounting. When I asked Judge Stuart Tidy to grant me a subpoena that would allow me to get the documents from Chase, this would not require any employee to show up, just simply send me the documents. He refused them. The 1099 would clearly shows that the Chase employees are lying, and it also shows that Chase may be attempting a widespread fraud on the IRS to avoid paying taxes. Again, Judge Tidy decided not to allow that subpoena. This is something that, that any party would have been entitled to. It is standard discovery. Uh, if Woolman Oh, I knew in my case, or I'm sorry, the 1099 made my case, but Woolman knew it was much, much more important to her clients. It proved that some of her clients had committed perjury and that her other client had committed fraud with the IRS. She wanted the case to be over before Chase was required to send me the 1099. Now, this next part is a little complicated, but it's very important when you think about it. If Woolman would have been allowed to present her summary motion to Tidy on January 21st as she had wanted, and if Tidy had quashed my subpoena of Chase's records to, of my account as Woolman had wanted, then Woolman could have presented her summary motion to the court without having to face the contradictory evidence of the 1099, 1099C cancellation of debt form and the contradictory testimony of Solstead and Wallach that Chase had charged off my account on January 31st, 2011. In effect, what I'm saying here is that if, if Woolman would have been allowed to end the case in late January by summary motion before any evidence would have been presented to the court, she could have avoided the smoking gun evidence of the 1099, which clearly showed that her, her clients had lied and she may very well have helped them lie in the process. So she wanted to avoid that and Judge Tidy was doing everything he could to make sure that she had that opportunity. If Tidy had quashed my subpoenas of Solstead, Smith, and Wallach as Woolman had wanted, then Woolman could have presented her summary motion on January 21st without having her clients be required to testify under oath concerning the discrepancies between their affidavits and the 1099-C cancellation of debt form. When a comparison is made between Solstead, Smith, and Wallach's testimony and pleadings to the court and their employer Chase's declaration to the IRS, it is clear that Chase, Solstead, Smith and Wallach are lying to someone. I made this point to Tidy in a February 21, 2012 uh, letter supported by an affidavit and relevant documents including the 1099-C cancellation of debt form. Tidy had already agreed over Woolman's objections to postpone the tw February 21st hearing until a later date after receiving a statement from my doctor indicating that the stress of a hearing at that time could induce a stroke. Woolman and I agreed on a new hearing date of April 16th and I submitted a proposed order to Tidy, again requesting that the hearing be limited to testimony from Solstead, Smith, and Wallach in regards to the discrepancy between their affidavits and the 1099-C cancellation of debt form. Tidy denied my request that same day and again allowed Woolman to set the agenda for the April 16th hearing. So again, Judge Tidy refused to 
to require Woolman's clients, the employees of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, to testify about why there was such a substantial discrepancy between what their employer and their co-defendant, J.P. Morgan Chase, had filed with the IRS under the penalty of fraud and what they were telling the court here in South Dakota. And when I asked Judge Tidy to separate the two hearings so that the those employees would have to testify and that that evidence could be used while he when he made a decision on the case, he again refused to do so and again allowed his friend and the and a partner in his former law firm to decide what uh, information could be discussed in the courtroom during the scheduled hearing. At that point, I decided to develop a criminal complaint and submit it to South Dakota and federal law enforcement. Shortly after that, Tidy engaged in additional ex parte communication. Again, that's communication where he has a conversation about the case with representatives from one party without informing the representatives of the other party. While it's not always the case, quite often it's done for the purpose of committing a criminal act. Tidy then allowed Chase attorney Jennifer Woolman to submit a brief, brief based on fa a false statement of fact or law in order to protect the Chase employees that had committed perjury. Ms. Woolman submitted an affidavit in claiming that certain tax codes and certain cases that define the tax codes said one thing when in fact they said something completely different. Now, Ms. Woolman has been an attorney for a long period of time. She's a president of the South Dakota Trial Lawyers Association and she's a member of the South Dakota Bar Ethics Committee. I find it difficult to believe that she simply misunderstood every statute and every piece of case law that she submitted to the court. Judge Tidy should have known that this information was inaccurate, particularly after I filed a brief detailing case by case and statute by statute uh, the misrepresentations that this woman had made. I also filed a motion that she be held con in contempt of court because the evidence was overwhelming. Despite uh, over two this being done over two months ago, Judge Tidy has refused to rule on that motion for contempt, again protecting Ms. Woolman. Tidy denied my request that same day and again allowed Woolman, as I said, to set the agenda for the April 16th hearing. Submitting false statements of fact or law to a court is a serious violation of the South Dakota Rules of Professional Conduct for Attorneys and could result in that attorney, Ms. Woolman, being disbarred. Judge Tidy then protected the attorney by refusing to rule on the motion on a motion filed by me asking that Chase Attorney Jennifer Woolman be held in contempt for those violations. Judge, Judge Tidy's actions violated South Dakota canons of judicial ethics. In particular, canon number two, a judge shall avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety in, in all the judge, judge's activities and D, disciplinary responsibilities, a judge who receives information indicating a substantial likelihood that a lawyer has committed a violation of the code of professional responsibility should take appropriate action. A judge having knowledge that a lawyer has committed a violation of the code of professional responsibility that raises a substantial question as to the lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer in other respects shall inform the appropriate authority, which in this case would have been the South Dakota Bar Association. Judge Tidy refused to, uh, not to, uh, to notify the Bar Association despite all of the evidence in front of him. I also submitted the complaint to Minnehaha County State's Attorney Aaron McGowan because Mr. McGowan is responsible for the area that would include both the residences of Ms. Woolman and Judge Tidy as well as Judge Rappel. However, he has refused to investigate the matter because Pamela Tidy, it, Judge Tidy's wife, is an attorney on his staff. Judicial Qualifications Commission, those are the people that are responsible for policing the judges in the state of South Dakota. Claims to have investigated judges Tidy and Rappel and failed to find any evidence of improper actions on their part. Let me say that again. They claim that in the face of the overwhelming evidence of abuse, abuse and judicial authority, conflict of interest, and potentially criminal obstruction of justice from the documents and evidence provided to them and that were available to them in the court record could not find any evidence of wrongdoing. 
I wonder how much more effective their investigation would have been if they had contacted me, which they never did, and asked for access to the over 200 pages of documents and over 10 hours of audio recordings I have in my possession. Normally you would think that when somebody is doing an objective or meaningful investigation, they would at least go to the person that has all of the evidence beyond what was already available to them. Apparently, the people at the Judicial Qualifications Commission felt that they could do a proper investigation without actually having access to any of that evidence. What this means is that when J.P. Morgan Chase reach, is in front of a, a judge who does not compromise his integrity or uh, clearly conspires with the counsel for J.P. Morgan Chase to assist them outside of the law, even then they don't comply with the law. In this case, when they had, by extension through their attorney, the judge in their pocket, of course they didn't have to do quite this much because the judge was running interference for them. The fact that Chase is using repossession agents that claim to have an affiliation with law enforcement does not surprise me. Nor am I surprised that Chase would spend tens of thousands of dollars attempting to cover that fact up, even though they admit in correspondence that they are speeding this, spending this outrageous sum in order to recover less than $200. Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase Bank has spent probably in the range of forty dollars to $50,000 in legal fees over an issue involving what they initially requested was $161 in change. You'll have to decide whether it's because they're trying to cover up the inappropriate and illegal activities of their repossession agents or whether or not they simply want to protect the Attorney General of the State of South Dakota, the United States Attorney uh, for South Dakota, and a judge uh, by hushing the issue up through improper court actions. The fact that J. That J. That J. P. Morgan Chase is employing agents that feel they are above the law and then spending huge amounts to protect those agents from exposure and prosecution makes me concerned for my personal safety. That concern is the reason I am posting this deposition on the internet. Please understand what I'm saying here. If J.P. Morgan Chase feels they're above the law, and if they feel that in the state of South Dakota that they are untouchable because they own the United States Attorney and they own the state's attorney, or the attorney general, and they own some of the judges in, in the second judicial circuit where I had lived until recently, and if they own one of the largest law firms in the state, if something were to have happened to me, or, or would happen to me, there'd be nobody to investigate. I also wonder if they have taken such a hard line in this case in order to cover up a systemic program of filing inflated or false 1099 statements with the IRS. Doing so would allow them to claim expenses they have never incurred, which would allow them to avoid paying taxes on their earnings. This is a simple way of being able to inflate their profits. If they claim expenses that they never had, they will make more money because they won't have to pay taxes on any money that they claim as an expense that they didn't actually incur. That will allow them to reduce the actual amount of profit that they have to claim to the IRS, which will reduce the amount of taxes that they have to pay. The Internet seems to be full of complaints about just this particular issue, about fraudulent or false 1099s. I suppose getting favorable treatment from a United States attorney or an attorney general makes such behavior easier to get away with. 